Radio right here on the Talk To Me station, AM 1300 WMEL, sponsored by AVET Project. Folks, we have got an interesting conversation going on, and I sure hope you're all listening in. And you know what? Grab the phone and call your buddies, your sisters, your brothers, your fathers. This is an important topic. We're talking with a combat vet himself, Michael Foster, and of course, Dr. Scott Fairchild has joined us, and we appreciate you being here, Doc, because be here. you really lend some perspective on all this. Before the break, Michael, you were talking about the fact that you'd processed a huge number of bodies. You were in mortuary affairs with the yeah. United States Army, and uh, your your stint, your deployment was about what nine months again? Yeah, um, it's about um, seven months. About seven, seven months. months. Yeah. And so then you rotate out. Obviously, a fresh crew's coming in. Yeah. You come back to the states. What happened then? Kind of give us a thumbnail sketch. Well, I, uh, once I started leaving uh, Iraq to go to Kuwait. Um, I had a very difficult time. There's a lot of people like singing karaoke and stuff like that, and there's, you know, some people don't sing that good. <laughs> but you know, I I was seriously like I was going off the deep end, and I had soldiers hold me back to go up there. I, I was I was really gonna hurt people, and it, it was really a bad thing. And I wasn't on any any drugs or any of that stuff at the time, and it it was so hard. I I don't even know how I dealt with it at that time, but. Um, and then I went back home, and I, you well, know, before I, you got back home, you had you had an uh, incident on a helicopter, right? Yeah, well, that was um, in Iraq. Okay, um, tell us about that. I was doing a hero mission, and uh, what is that? What's a hero mission? Hero mission is um, uh, just going out and uh, you know dealing with uh, uh, hospital flights or um, going out to the the site where they got shot at or something like that, you know, like where we fly out there, we land, touch ground, and then we, you know, run out there, grab bodies, and bring them back in. And so we, we stuck them on a, um, a litter stand and uh, we carried him back and we carried another one back. And at the time, you know, we, we were getting fired upon by two different sides. I don't know who was firing at us or what was going on. I didn't know anything. I didn't know uh, it about. We didn't have very uh, communication with uh, the pilot or any of that stuff. You know, the pilot just knew where to go, and it was it was it was that bad. I mean, I was just like, oh my God, where are we going? You this know? is just to bring our dead and wounded. Yeah, back. yeah, and you know, so we're out there doing this and that, and um, we we come back and we're inside the helicopter, and the helicopter's trying to take off, and the doors are left open, and that was our very first. Uh, mission that we did for, uh, uh, you know, where the person got shot at. So it was very, um, you know, it was. Um, Sounds like it's pretty chaotic. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. It was just really, you know, nuts. Really. Did he kind of bank uh, left or right to kind yeah, of get he, away he from like, the fire? He, yeah, he was kind of like banking left and right, but um, I think he was trying to get lift. Mm -hmm. And 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 it just started shaking, and the doors are wide open, so the the. The litter stands are metal on the bottom, and it's a hard, hard floor on the surface, and it's just like scooting out the door. And I made that judgment call to stand up, you know, and latch my belt with one, you know, one twist of my my hand, and stood straight up, and I hit my helmet on the uh, the roof of the uh, uh, Blackhawk, and um, I just com immediately collapsed and fell on the bodies, and it was. I didn't know if I was going to fall out. I didn't know if I was going to do this. I mean, it was it so was So your awful. fast action to not yeah. lose the litter out the side of the helicopter resulted in you bang bashing your head and getting yeah. a concussion. Yeah, and, and it was that was when my traumatic brain injury started to happen. It was it was it was um, right then. I just so you got immediately passed out. happening all around. Yeah, you've just gotten the bodies onto the helicopter. The litters yeah. are shaking because the helo pilot's trying to get that chopper lifted, yeah. and it's all happening at once. It had to have been, like you said, Doc, chaotic. Just, yeah, just yeah it, was, it was really nuts. I thought, it was, I thought I was doing good because, you know, I, I got out, I, everything was good, and then the body started falling out the Blackhawk, and I was just like, all right, stand up, and bam, hit my head, and I, I just thought, like, wow, I wouldn't see my daughter. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. I, I just, I was thinking all these thoughts in my head, and it was... But I couldn't do anything. My body was out. 
like I was just paralyzed. And ironically, you stood up to kind of do something about keeping those yeah. litters from sliding out the door. Yeah. And ironically, even though you hit your head and mm -hmm. passed out and fell down, yeah. your weight on top of them actually kept them from sliding out yeah. the door. So well, you accomplished my, my, the mission. My feet were wedged in between the, the seats and stuff oh, like that. Lord. So, I mean, it was, it was really something that, that I did. Yeah. Um, now, w tell me what happened when you got back, because you didn't realize, really, the damage that had been done to your head. Well, I, I landed, and 45 minutes later, and when I hit the ground, and I hit it kind of hard, I got up. I just immediately, you know, just looked at everything and stood right. up, and I was just trying to, you know, right. shake Instinct. some things off and yeah. everything like that. And um, immediately, you know, our, our team, there's a team of eight people. And they came out and they, you know, started grabbing the body. And I just walked off and got in the, uh, the Humvee. And uh, my sergeant was there and he's like, Foster, where's the bodies? You know, and I'm like, I, they're behind me. You know, I'm here to tell you, you know, <laughs> stuff that's, that's going on. And he's like, okay, well, just we'll wait for him to come here. And I was like, okay. And I was just sitting there, and I was out of it. I just, so you were disoriented. Yeah, I was very disoriented. And he got out of the vehicle to go outside and salute the the, the fallen comrades that, that went down. And I was just still sitting in the car, and he was like, Foster, Foster, like screaming at me. And I just I just got out and stood to the side, and I just it was this really hard thing. But then 36 hours after that. Uh, I had a stroke. It was a um, uh, it was a hemorrhagic bleed to the brain, and it was obviously uh, attributed to this injury. Yeah, right? yeah. And I didn't know any of this stuff was happening to me because I thought it was just battle fatigue. I thought I was tired. I thought it, you know, yeah. I was doing this and that, and I was paralyzed for two days. And I I wasn't in the right frame of mind to do anything. So I was just like, you know, telling people, you know, back off, and like I was, you know, shouting out. You know, nasty words and stuff like that. And Doc, it was, is that uh, pretty natural? Oh, yeah. Well, it, it's natural and unnatural. And, and yeah. in, in fact, uh, unnatural. it's natural response to what happened to you physically and emotionally, uh, but kind of uh, unnatural for, for a normal, health, normal, healthy individual. And I, I recall, Michael, when you said, uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything happened. I was kind of shaking my head. And, and yeah. as, re as I recall, uh, you went to work and processed those bodies. Yeah, yeah, and I did. Then, and then I recall after that, I think... Uh, you slept for was it 18 hours? Uh, it was um, 16 hours. 16 hours, and yeah. uh, you know, folks, when you're in the green zone and there's rocket rocket attacks coming in and things like that, sleeping for more than two or three hours is is unheard of. And you mm -hmm. slept for 16 hours, which is indicative of that traumatic brain injury. Yeah. And I like the way you described it in your book when you said that. You, you, in fact, your sergeant encouraged you to go get some help, and you're like, oh, I'm okay, I can do this, and mm -hmm. you're kind of making it and faking it, you know, mm -hmm. fake it till you make it, <laughs> and uh, you kept going along for days and days, and those, as you describe it in your book, those little br blood droplets were just seeping out of your brain, yeah. and continually causing uh, even more, more damage. More damage, yeah. yeah, more damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it was, amazing. It, it was, it was, it was really uh, something to uh, behold. So, Michael, after all this, and like Doc said, you kept on with your mission, yeah. how long after that incident was it that you were able to rotate out and come back to the States? Um, I, it's kind of hard because, I, you know, the traumatic brain injury and stroke, you know, you don't know what, what time period and frame, but I think it happened in the summertime, so, and then I came back uh, December 15th, um, and it was, like, really something to... Uh, you know, I, but you people knew. tell me that I shouldn't be here, you know, and I'm just like, you know, and I'm here, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. deal with it. <laughs> and you came back as a, diff as a different person. And, yeah. You know, the mantra of somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder or with traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. is, I just want my old self back. Mm -hmm. So then we had to start on that journey, didn't we? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had that was to, tough. Yeah, it was tough. And, you know, just doing some individual therapy and, and doing some group therapy, participating with the group and, and doing a QEEG to find out how is that brain doing and what's what's working, uh, what's working too hard, what's not working hard enough. And, and uh, Michael has been a dedicated trooper coming in a couple times a week to do the brain retraining. And uh, he has he has done so well with that, uh, that Michael, uh, even though he has PTSD and traumatic brain injury, 
he has the well, he had a stroke for crying oh, out. Oh, that's uh, yeah. absolutely. He has the sole custody, the primary sole custody of his daughter, who's now seven. I uh, know six. 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 Uh, and she's a sweetheart, and he's he's one of the best fathers I've ever seen. It's awesome. amazing. He does a great job with Thank her. Thank you. Well, yes. so, Michael, and I want to talk about this. We've only got a little bit of time left, but come on. What prompted you to want to put your story out in the form of a book? Um, I think that people and, and you know, presidents and stuff like that, they, they want to keep everything away from people. And I just said, look, here, this, this is my story. What this is what happened at the time. Them. And, you know, what they don't know won't hurt them, but it really does hurt them in the mm -hmm. long run. Mm -hmm. So I... Just said, okay, I'm writing the story, getting it out to the people. I did it for myself because I was, you know, going through a lot of kind stuff. Of therapeutic, yeah, maybe. Therapeutic. Absolutely. And, and and then, you know, I'm just on this road of like, okay, let's just, you know, get it out to as many people as I can, because people need to hear that side of the story. So, so that was the impetus. You said, look. All this stuff happens. The public back here doesn't have a clue this is going on. Yeah. And the sacrifices that are being made both yeah. in, well, across the board in our military because you're all heroes to us, mm -hmm. honest to goodness. And it's not that easy to do, as Michael found out. It's a challenge. I mean, both, uh, you know, the administrative challenge of getting somebody to write with you and publisher and all that other crazy stuff. But I'm talking about the emotional challenge uh, because, again, when you write about each event, you think about other events. Mm -hmm. And as you write, I know Michael's been talking about this, you, you revisit so many of those things and emotionally you end up going through it again. Yeah. And when you go through it over and over again, it's painful. Uh, but Michael has been determined and courageous to be able to do that. And he's produced a, a, a fantastic book that uh, starts out talking about how he worships superheroes as a young boy. Mm -hmm. And then working 16, 18 hours a day processing bodies, uh, he had to become a superhero to honor those superheroes who had gave their lives for our country. Yeah. And it's just a, a fantastic read. I can't wait till the publisher gets a hold of it All and right. gets it out. The, fa the Iraq, the Faces of War, uh, an amazing account. And it's very therapeutic mm -hmm. as well as we... Uh, just over the past couple weeks, uh, we actually read Michael's book back to him, and as we went through each chapter, we would do some therapeutic processing with some of the stuff. And and I tell you, a couple of the chapters, uh, you know, just brought a lot of emotion out uh, in me as well. Yeah. Now, yeah. what's the full title of the book, Michael? It's uh, Iraq Faces of War. Um, dot com, and then the 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 book is Faces of War, uh, Iraq, uh, the Road to Heaven or Hell. So. And this, this, uh, give us, give us a little sketch of the book from beginning to end. You know, obviously, not um, the whole thing, but trace your steps. What, what happens during the book? The first two chapters is just, you know, basically kind of cutting in and out. But it's, it's a, you know, basic training, AIT, you know, doing everything through. The Normal soldiers' yeah. experience. Well, background in Normal introduction, stuff. yeah. And then, and then it goes straight into the war. It just starts talking about everything that was happening at that time and it just keeps on going and going i mean there's some things that you know we all don't like and this and that and, and, and you know that's what i talk about in my book uh, like the geneva convention and and like how their money is being you know abused and stuff like that and, you know and you mentioned really, that before we came on the air that there's a political yeah. aspect of your book, and yeah. it's important to you. Yeah. You want to share that. You want to yeah. get these people to start thinking in a different way about the war and what happened. Uh, it came in like 19, what, 40s? Or I don't know. Don't, 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 and you know, it's nowadays. It's, there's a lot more things that we can be doing for our country to make it better. Mm -hmm. And we're Give not doing an anything. Give us an example. Give us an example. Well, um, for example, um, we had this no-shoot policy, and um, no was, shoot policy. Yep. Huh? <laughs> no shoot policy. Shoot. And um, so we had no ammunition. Well, oh, I, so we're at war and yeah. you're not authorized to shoot. Yep. And I took the rounds off of fallen soldiers that had rounds on them, and I put it in my own magazines and I load up everyone. So that was that was one thing that I did. So our for, rules of engagement yeah. prohibited them from loading their rifles. Yeah, and, and certain people came up to me and asked me for ammunition and stuff like that, and I gave it to them. So you took care of your troops, yeah. uh, your colleagues, yeah. which which is uh, certainly admirable. And you know, and, and just I some through folks each and every single. We're talking about 2008, yeah. Doc. What's mm -hmm. happened over in Libya? What did we hear mm -hmm. on the news? Mm -hmm. Our 
embassy guards were not allowed to have ammunition in their rifles. Yeah. Folks, are you hearing this? And this is a soldier that who was there, witnessed it, lived it, and this is just part of his book. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent example. So that really, how it obviously affected you. Yeah. It must have affected the, our other troops there too. Oh yeah, it it really did. And the, you know, a lot of people didn't want to leave or go out outside and you know do their missions and stuff like that. And it was it, they were scared. They were scared. It's kind of hard to go outside and do your mission if you're unarmed, uh, you know, and, yeah. and just the stress and the tension, uh, you know, it's not just to wait for the body to come to you. Uh, yeah. Michael, can you share with us, uh, you know, that one time you got caught in traffic in the Baghdad traffic circle and I, what was underneath your vehicle? Um, well, I was in a, a soft top Humvee because they didn't give us a, a, you know, no armored, no there. armored Humvees or any of that stuff. You know, it was just like, you know, basically like sheet of paper. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, we, we were, we're pulling around, we're trying to find this family and everything, and there's a bunch of people outside, and there's a bunch of traffic and all that stuff, and we're driving around, and we get in this traffic jam, and, you know, we're behind a convoy, and, you know, we start to move a little forward, a little forward, and then we stop, and I look to my right out the window, and there is a, um, little trench dug in, and then mm -hmm. there's, like, metal poles and, and there's like wires sticking out of it and you know and I'm like that looks like an IED <laughs> and you're sitting on top yeah, of it yeah sitting right on top of with it with nowhere and, to go and I didn't know what to do and I, everyone else was just like what you know and they're all looking at it and I, they didn't want to go outside or anything but mm -hmm. they, you know they were sitting there mm -hmm. and we're, I was just like what do we do? And we just started laughing. Any we, just, we just started laughing because it, you know, nervous nothing, laughter. Yeah, yeah. it's like nervous laughter. And then, and then I, I was looking up high, and everyone else started looking up high for you know people with cell, cell phones, phones or right. some somebody you know threatening mm -hmm. to detonate it. And um, my team members that were on the other side of the gate, they were up on top of the truck, and they looked out you know across everything, and they saw a person with a cell phone on top of a sand dune. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> trying oh, to get a signal. <laughs> oh, trying to get a signal. Yeah, trying wow. to get a signal. So, yeah. so, so your life and the life of your team could have been saved by the fact that this person couldn't get a signal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so that, I mean, the, the feeling of helplessness, the feeling mm -hmm. of stress in a situation like that, I'm just going out on my mission to, do, to, to pick up this body. And here and I am stuck in traffic. Unarmored Humvee. So the next yeah. time you're stuck in traffic... Hmm. You know, look underneath <laughs> your vehicle and think about it. Well, that. look at trucks. Yeah. Look at trucks and, and, you know, realize that people stop for a reason. Right. They don't stop next to trucks. Now, is it hard to stop thinking about that when you're driving on the streets no. in, in Bernard no. County? I mean, it's, now, do you... it's not hard. It's easy. <laughs> you just keep thinking about it. I just keep it. thinking about it because it, it's, it's something that really, you know. Dr. Fairchild, we hear this a lot. You've been on the program before with other guests, other combat warriors. Mm -hmm. This is prevalent. They can't get this out of their head. Well, unfortunately, what happens in the combat zone is you're a learner. You're a super learner. You're an over learner. You learn, your body learns, your mind learns, your muscles learn what it takes to survive. Yeah. And you learn it so, so, so well that when you come back to the real world or back to the civilian world or back to your hometown, you can't get rid of that anymore. It's stuck with you. And so you're going to, you see a small child on the side of the road with a backpack or a box, you're going to, you're going to pull the other way. You're going to, you're going to react because your mind is still in the combat zone. I know one of our veterans asked uh, another veteran in a group, he said, when were you in Iraq? And the guy just looked at him and he said, about two o'clock this morning. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, it's, the it's always there. That's the truth. It's always there. Yeah. Folks, I want to take and just pause for a moment. I want to continue this, but we have Joe Anderson from American Legion Post 1 in Titusville on the line. Can you hear me, Joe? Yes, I can. Well, thank you so much for joining us on American Warrior Radio. Uh, we're right in the middle of this conversation, but I know you got some important news, and I wanted to allow you to share it with our audience. What you got going on up there? Outstanding. That's a heck of an outreach. I really appreciate that. Were you, uh, were, did you spearhead this effort, or who, who, who's, Post One is responsible for getting this going?
I am up at the uh, DAV in Titusville as part of the uh, this... DHS homeless support today. I'm uh, standing outside here with the homeless people. At the stand down. Very good. Is, the is there a good crowd? We haven't heard a report from that one. Is there a good crowd up there? Outstanding, and I'm I'm guessing the river rats are helping out as usual with lunch. <laughs> Outstanding. So big shout out to Big Al and his river rats. One more time, Joe. When is this open house that you're hosting? Awesome. Joe. If there's any organizations that want to participate in this, they can contact me too at 321-225-8142. That's 225-8142. Correct. Awesome. Joe, thanks for joining us and best of luck and keep up the good work. Hey, Joe. Hey. I want to thank all my veterans for everything they've done for our country. Fantastic. Joe, this is Dr. Fairchild. I just came from up there. You've got a great group of volunteers. George Taylor is running around. You guys are getting it all done. We so we so appreciate you. And you said you're the ag adjutant for your unit. I just want to encourage you to keep agitating. <laughs> all righty. For our veterans and their families. Of course. Have a great day. Well, that was Joe Anderson, Post 1 in Titusville. You heard her a week from today up there, open house. You want to get involved, do so. Uh, Michael, before we get off the air here, I want, again, your website. Yeah. My website is uh, IraqFacesOfWar.com. IraqFacesOfWar, all one word, dot com. They can read about you and your mission, mortuary affairs. Uh, you've got some interesting tidbits and information about dog tags. I saw that. Yeah. So there, there's a, a little bit of everything there. Yeah. And the, the book, what's the status on the book right now? Well, the status on the book right now is um, being done by an editor. It's out in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And my mother is out there right now going to talk to her and she's going to do, you know, phone conference. And um, then uh, we're going to decide from there and then we're going to publish it. Um, I don't really have to fight anything because I'm, you know... Blessed to have your yeah. mom on your side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, 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 well, I have to do some things, but I mean, like, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I love my mom. She's a really great person. I love people in my family. Uh, they're really good people. So. They've been remarkably supportive, and it's so important for the families of our veterans to yeah. be there for them, and to, to the extended families of veterans yeah. as well. And uh, The community in general. Yeah, absolutely. We're yeah. fortunate in Brevard to have a, a good, supportive military community. And, and actually, you, Michael, moved here because mm -hmm. uh, we were providing some support and therapy. And, uh, that was the only place that was providing it for me at the time. I was Did just you all like, hear that? I'm moving out there. Who, so, Bay Tree Behavioral Health you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. Hats off to you, Doc. I appreciate that. You know, this is a man, Doc Fairchild. Yes, he's career military. He's doctor of psychology and all that. But you know what? Not that I'm telling people to do this, but I have his inside number, so I can do this. I had called this man <laughs> at 1130 at night with uh, a combat warrior who was experiencing some, you know, tragic situations, and he's jumped right in to help. So thank you, Doc, and thank you for it. sharing with us on American Warrior Radio. Michael, much success to you on your book, IraqFacesOfWar.com. You can find out all about it. Do you wanna, have? Go ahead. I want to thank the the people that are on my site right now and all the tweets and you know just really really helps me out a lot. Means and, a lot to you, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. I mean, I'm not very big on tweeting, but you know it really means something. Social media can help. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, again, thank you, both Dr. Fairchild and Michael Foster. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to talking to you down the road when you get your book published. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to share with you folks, again, Space Coast Community Law School, our good friend, Britta Hawkins. This is an important course that's coming up, Firearms Law Standard Ground Law, on this Thursday, October 18th. You're going to want to get there early. Judge John Murphy does an incredible job. The room is going to be full, I can tell you that. If you want to find out more, 
sccls.com, sccls.com. Don't forget about the Veterans Day celebration coming up on November 11th from 5 to 8. Go to avetproject.org and learn more. We've got tickets for the KSG shotgun, too. We'll be back again next week with another important episode of American Warrior Radio. As Glenn always says, don't forget, thank a vet.